And so my worry is not so much that that some robot overlord is going to um, you know enslave us. It's that we will be enslaved by our worst characteristics, or at least our most instinctive characteristics, as amplified by AI. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio. This week, our guest is NBC technology correspondent Jacob Ward, who recently released his book, The Loop, How Technology is Creating a World Without Choices and How to Fight Back. In this episode, we focus broadly on the ways in which technology and AI specifically are learning from the worst instincts of human beings and then using those bad behaviors to shape our future choices. As a result, Jacob suggests that this creates a feedback loop of increasingly limited and increasingly short-sighted behavior. This conversation includes an exploration of topics such as big data, bad incentives for programmers, profit motives, historical biases that are reflected in data, system one versus system two brain systems, and a whole lot more. So without getting into any more details, let's just go ahead and jump into it. Everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, Jacob Ward. Then I think the best place to start is with your, obviously with your recent book, The Loop, How Technology is Creating a World Without Choices and How to Fight Back. And as someone who has written books myself, one of my favorite questions to ask authors is, why did you lock yourself in a room with a laptop, shut yourself off from social experiences in the world at large, and decide to focus on this one subject? The process of writing a book, actually, I would say, did not agree with me. And I grew up in a family of writers. I have uh, my dad is a, a writer. He's got uh, nearly a dozen, a dozen books to his name and my, i've got an uncle who's a writer i've got cousins who are writers and they all they, it never seemed to bother them but for me especially with young kids at home i found it tremendously painful to tell everybody no i cannot hang with you this weekend no i cannot you know play uno with you after dinner uh so i did not enjoy it and i my i have tremendous respect and i would say a little bit of uh alarm about the kind of people who gravitate toward that. Maybe later in my life when I'm retired or something, I'll, I'll want to shut myself away and, uh, you know, be more that way. But I, it did not agree with me. That said, I also knew that this was a moment that I sort of had to act. And I, I went on this sort of personal journey that was inspired, um, in part by a documentary series that I got to work on, in part by the election of President Trump, which sort of was a, a, a signal that many of the themes that, that we had been observing in making this documentary series about human behavior was really coming to fruition. Um, and I then at the same time was experiencing all of these things in my work as a technology correspondent where I was just seeing a lot of really alarming trends coming together and I just thought, you know, this is really the moment that I got to go for it uh, and, and try and make this happen. And so I, I did sort of transform my life. I quit drinking so that I could wake up early in the mornings and go to sleep and have a good sleep at night, you know, and get, survive on very little sleep. Um, and I sort of made this bargain with my wife about it and, and we, you know, got through it. But uh, yeah, I don't recommend writing books to people when people say, God, that must've been great. You know, how'd you do it? I say, I have no idea. And no, it was not great. Um, but I'm very glad it's behind me and I'm very grateful to you uh, for uh, taking the, the time to talk about it. Yeah, of course, man. So on that note, then what is this idea of the loop that you do put forth in the book? Can you kind of lay out a foundation for us to have a, a better understanding? So it's funny to be talking to you because it was actually Ray Kurzweil's idea of the singularity was actually one of the ways I got started on this idea. So I'd heard for a long time when I was the editor of Popular Science and when I wrote for Wired and I had, you know, I sort of moved in the circles where Kurzweil's name is, is a pretty household name. You know, this idea that computerized intelligence is going to take over human intelligence, right? It's going to, it's going to exceed human intelligence. And what will the implications of that be? Um, I had lived with that as a sort of background hum in my life for quite a while. But then 
I did this documentary series called Hacking Your Mind for PBS. That was a, basically a crash course for me and is a crash course for the viewer in the very automatic ways that human beings make decisions. It turns out if you throw decisions at us under pressure and where we don't have enough resources to make them properly, either enough information or enough calories or what have you, um, it turns out that the mistakes we tend to make are very automatic and very systematic and predictable. And um, I went all over the world and got to meet all these incredible researchers um, who specialize in studying that. And at the same time, I was also noticing all of this work going on in the private sector around artificial intelligence, where people are trying to create an automatic, systematic way for AI to jump in and make decisions that we don't like to make for ourselves. Who gets a job? Who gets bail? Who gets a loan? And I started to think to myself, well, wait a minute. Okay, if the profit motive of private industry is throwing sort of, you know, all of the greatest minds at, you know, this question, and we know on the other side of the fence, you know, in academia, that so many of our decisions are incredibly shapeable, you know, uh, systemically predictable, and as a result, sort of manipulatable. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, okay, what's going to happen when they when we throw AI at these fundamental forms of human decision making? And I started to think, you know, maybe the threat here is not what Kurzweil and others have talked about, right? This idea that that we're going to be kind of overseen by a general artificial intelligence down the road, you know, the, the Terminator idea that robot overlords will take us, you know, will take over, uh, which had been sort of this background idea for so long. I thought to myself, you know, before we get to that phase, I think we're going to hit this other phase in which an automated process begins where we analyze human behavior we shape it a little bit and, and winnow down the choices. Humans make you know, choices from that more limited menu, and then that gets refined again by AI, and we get a, a even smaller menu at that point. And to me, that forms this idea of the loop, this loop of shrinking choices that is a sort of downward spiral away from uh, some of our most hard-won decision-making abilities or sort of modern abilities as humans cognitively and really this kind of amplification and i argue in the book an over amplification of our most instinctive decision-making patterns and so my worry is not so much that that some robot overlord is going to um you know enslave us it's that we will be enslaved by our worst characteristics or at least our most instinctive characteristics as amplified by ai and that idea being caught in the loop is is what sort of inspired this book. Yeah, and in, in the book you talk about the two kinds of brains, and I believe you talk about in the documentary as well, and um, hacking your brain. What can you talk a bit about those two kinds of brains and and how the artificial intelligence is um, using one of them versus the other? Yeah, so you know the the concept of a dual process theory is what the the researchers who study this stuff. Uh, call it dual process theory has been around for a long time. And it's the idea that we have these two minds, right? One is an instinctive automatic mind. And the other is a uh, much more uh, contemplative, cautious, reasoning, rational mind. And the this idea has been best popularized by Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Fast Thinking Brain, Slow Thinking Brain, Automatic Brain, rational brain. And um, he and his research colleague for decades, Amos Tversky, did a lot of experimentation uh, that kind of led him to thinking about this. But it goes back, you know, to all sorts of uh, other research. We found that in, this is not, when I say we, it's not me, I'm, I'm a journalist just reporting this stuff. But the, but the researchers who study this stuff have studied things like um, uh, the fact that in our eyes, our visual system is in fact a dual process system. That it turns out in one famous experiment, if you, you know those uh, those like funhouse illusions where a face is carved into the wall. When you walk past it, it looks like it's it's going past you, you know, looking after you, you know, following you. Um, that I remember, and that that illusion used to scare the bejesus out of me when I was a kid. Well, it turns out that 
even though your conscious mind is fooled by that, in experiments, um, these uh, researchers showed that, in fact, if you then put a little plastic fly inside the convex face and just glue it there for a second, and then you ask somebody to reach in and flick it off, even though your conscious mind thinks that that thing is a protruding face, your unconscious mind will reach in and perfectly gauge the spot it needs to be to flick that fly off. And the suggestion that results is that we have a conscious form of seeing and an unconscious form of, of seeing. And they call it, I think it's a, I can't remember what their phrase was, but it's something like um, vision for seeing and vision for action, something like that. And, and it turns out hearing, there's that same kind of thing. Um, uh, touch has that same kind of thing that we have these dual processes and, and the, the buckets that they are, the two buckets is an instinctive one and a thinking about it one. And so what Kahneman basically, uh, you know, uh, wrote, writes about in his book is this broad idea that we have this ancient instinctive system that made most of our decisions for us in this very automatic way. And then this much more modern system and all sorts of evolu evolutionary uh, scientists have, have, you know, theorized that this system grew out of our, you know, our sort of new brains uh, that originated when we stopped just living for survival and began um, having bigger questions about death and the afterlife and, you know, how are we going to domesticate these cattle and all those kinds of things. That newer brain is your slow thinking brain that, that is cautious and creative and thinks things through. And it's why we have laws and math and all of this amazing art, you know, the problem that Kahneman identifies and that I'm trying to think about in this book is we like to think that we are using that cautious, creative brain system to the slow thinking brain most of the time, because that's who we like to think of ourselves as is creative and we're rational and we're thinking it all through. Well, what Kahneman and so many others have shown in their research is that no, in fact, most of the time, um, in fact, maybe more or less all the time, except in rare circumstances, your instinctive brain is in charge. It's driving the car. It's making the coffee. It turns out it may also be casting your vote for you. It may be, uh, you know, making decisions about who you befriend and trust, right? It's, it's a, the, the modern landscape, it turns out, is, you know, even though we're navigating it with this new more rational brain, it turns out that the modern landscape really has, uh, you know, that we're, we're using our system one, our, our fast thinking brain, probably most of the time. And when you throw that against things like social media, right, or addictive gameplay, or drugs, or, you know, any of a number of, of the sort of vices and social ills that we've invented, uh, you know, using the slow thinking brain, this is the great irony of it, right? It's we've used our best, the best parts of ourselves to in many ways make money off the worst parts of ourselves. And for me, that that is the crux of the dual process theory is this idea that we have, we're living in a world right now that, that, that pretends to be all about our slow thinking brain, but is in fact built to make money off our fast thinking brain. And to me, you throw AI into that mix and technology in general, and you're, you're I think, really playing with fire. Yeah. And so how has this, I guess, fast thinking brain become something that becomes systematized? Is this a case where we have bad programmers with bad incentives who are purposely cognitively creating bad systems? Or is it a case of the artificial intelligence just picking up on our bad behavior that we typically exhibit when we go about our lives? Like, or is it both? Well, I think, yeah, no, I think it's, this is a really good question. Um, I think that the big, so I think it's a combination of, of factors that play into this. So one of them is the illusion. Well, first of all, there's the grand illusion that we are making our own choices, right? The, the, I think that mo the modern, that modern politics and the modern landscape of, of, sort of popular thought about ourselves is that we make our own choices and, and that our instincts are, are often the best possible way to make a decision. And that's because we just like that idea 
I think in, in many ways better than like, like the, the sort of the, certainly the Western ideal of a kind of rugged individualist making her own decisions has always been this romantic idea. So like Han Solo in, you know, Star Wars is always saying, you know, leave me alone, C-3PO, you know, get away from me, nerd. Don't tell me the odds. I'm going with my gut, right? And then he's proven right. He gets through the asteroid field, right? He, he takes this, you know, Neo goes back into the matrix and, and gets Trinity out. You know, like we love those stories of people saying against all logic, I'm going to do this thing. And what's funny is that's, that's people thinking that they're making good choices, right? And the truth of the matter is that like the, the statisticians and the economists and the behavioral people would all say, you should listen to C-3PO. You know, you should not go into that asteroid field. You know, those movies would be very boring and very short as a result, but they would really make sense. You know, so I think there's a whole social backdrop of illusion when it comes to how we make choices that is that is an important first thing to understand. And then that, I think, infects how we build things. We start to think, well, you know what? We're all making our own choices. We're in charge of ourselves. It's all fine. So I can just make whatever seems to move the needle in any way. And that seems, you know, and that's perfectly ethical because people are making their own choices. You know, I'm not responsible for what other people do. I can only sort of offer suggestions, right? But what we're learning, right? And I think the, some of the top thinkers in, in the kind of reformist uh, circles in AI would say, oh, no, 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 no. It turns out we're not making, you know, we're, we're certainly what they would say is we are not, the, the data is not neutral, right? When you absorb, when, if you just grab data on the history of loan making in this country and use it to program a piece of AI about who should get loans, it's going to make deeply racist decisions about who gets loans. And that's because the systems of loan making in this country have always been stacked against black and brown communities. You know, you look at the history of redlining, you know, and how that set black and brown communities back, the inability to buy a house wherever they wanted to set them back in terms of generational wealth, you know, by a hundred years or more, you could fool yourself into thinking, oh, this data is neutral. And if I just feed it into this system, it's going to kick out a good neutral response. But it turns out, no, of course, that's not the case, right? And yet, I think a lot of engineers are quite shy, shy, shy the right word, you know, reluctant to mess with the data, right? Or to put any, put their finger on the scale at all of historical inequity. They'd rather just follow the data where it leads. That's a, how a lot of data scientists are trained. Um, and they, they're trained to account for confounding patterns and various things, but they're not trained to necessarily account for these things that as a country, we're only just beginning to grapple with when it comes to inequality and the rest of it. So there's that. And then I think there is also the profit motive itself, which has led many people to simply say, you know, if I can make a buck off a thing, then that thing is worth making a buck off of. And I've bumped into people, you know, it, it, what's interesting is, is that, you know, so, I, so I, there's a whole category of very addictive user interface design. And, and I, I know some of your listeners, I can hear their eyes rolling now, right? Because I know that people are allergic to the idea that making something uh, you know, that there is no such thing as a digital addiction, right? People like to say that, oh, you know, addictive behavior is, is certainly not the fault of the designer. It's, you know, the fault of the user, if anything. Well, okay, maybe, except that whole industries are being developed right now on the addictive potential of things like, um, you know, not just, I mean, conventional gambling, sports gambling and the rest of it. Not only is that having one of the most explosive growth periods it's ever had in its history, right? In November in California, where I live, we're going to vote on the idea that, that of legalizing online sports betting. I mean, that's going to create this vast industry in, a, in its own nation, essentially 40 million people, right? We are, we've already seen that. But even, even when you're gambling on stuff that, that like isn't even real, gambling on sports is one thing, and, and we can argue about whether or not that's a legit thing. But you know, you've got a whole category of things called social casino apps that just simulate the slot machine experience, simulate the poker experience. And people, I've interviewed dozens of people who've lost their shirts, lost their, lost their entire life savings to a $4.99 at a time game in which you bet on nothing and you can win nothing and yet you get hopelessly addicted. Um, and to my mind, the same design principles that are built into something like that, the tribalism of playing with your friends and the 
gamification, the, you know, the sort of the coming back for a surprise and don't lose your streak and all of this sort of stuff that people have learned over time is really, really compelling in user interface design and, and, and the, the onboarding of people and all that stuff. Well, that stuff also gets deployed in the name of good things, right? We see that in Peloton, right? You join the tribe of Peloton. Welcome to the Peloton family. Peloton's, of course, as I'm speaking, like taking a bath right now and is, and, you know, is, is, is having a really hard time financially. But that's sort of beside the point. The, you know, the, the, whether it's Peloton or Noom, you know, the, the um, uh, weight loss program, it's very similar design practices. And they're very, very effective as the ones that have been deployed for gambling and the ones that have been deployed for social casino gaming. So to me, it's, it's, you know, there are these tools that I think have been developed that we don't really understand why they work yet, but we're starting to hone in on it. They're entirely unregulated. And I think they're having a huge effect on human behavior. And so uh, I think it's a combination of this landscape, this cultural individualism, this, you know, the, the uh, broad allergy to believing that we could ever be gullible enough to fall for something like this. And, you know, the, the illusion that we're, that the d data is neutral and then just sort of the blanket profit motive. If you can make money off something, it's worth making money off of. I think those things are, are just working together in this case. And that seems like how it's leading us to what you would say is like a realm of fewer choices, right? Because as we get addicted to these things and as they kind of, let's just say, hijack our attention and bring our focus very narrowly into this one realm, we kind of become blind to, to other options, right? Is that kind of... Yeah, well, making? so that is the argument I'm making. I mean, and, and, it's, and it's beyond just the sort of attention economy stuff, which to me is the sort of easiest to grok. I'm also trying to articulate in this book that there is this broad broader tendency. And, and that tendency is essentially, I mean, what, what all of the people who study the dual process theory stuff, the fast thinking, slow thinking stuff have tried to explain to me is that the human brain is built to outsource its decisions and take shortcuts whenever it possibly can. And that is because we survived that way. Finding an efficient way of making decisions about which food to eat or who to trust, you know, or where to lie down for the night was the difference between survival and death when we lived on the open plains of what is now Africa, you know, whatever that was, 120,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. And, and the, the ability to outsource decision making to this instinctive system was in fact good because it kept us alive. Like if, a, you know, I, I use this example all the time as it was explained to me, you know, if you and I are sitting together in a cafe and a snake comes into the room with us, uh, you know, we don't take time to talk together about what kind of snake that is, right? Or if fire licks across the ceiling, we don't take a second to say, geez, how hot do you think that fire is, you know? We both recoil. And in fact, there's a whole world of incredible research about how our faces in fact, transmit horror between each other faster than we could ever explain how dangerous a situation is. If I make a face of horror, you catch it, you pick it up and transmit it to the next person. That's how you get a whole crowd running out of a room. You know, um, there's a famous routine from Cedric the Entertainer, the, the comic about how um, he, uh, when he sees other black people running, he can't help but run. And and it's a it's a really funny routine. But it's also very dark and it's absolutely spot on for uh, the behavioral science stuff, because it turns out that when you see other people, especially other people who resemble you doing a thing, you can't help but do it. And all of that is because we learned to survive with our tribe. Like it was good. That was really, really useful once upon a time. The problem is now it means we are primed. We are built intellectually to outsource tough decisions to an automatic system. And if that automatic system comes in the guise of a neutral seeming, very sleek piece of technology that miraculously pumps out great decisions for us, like who to hire, right? A job, something that is one of the hardest things to do right now, figure out who to hire for a job. You know, we love to hand that stuff over. We are built to hand that stuff over. And so not only do we do that in things like the attention economy, where, you know, I am very much guilty of spending hours so long on TikTok that TikTok actually has to tell me to go to bed. Little videos pop up that say, okay, you watched enough, go to bed. You know, but that's also true in all sorts of other systems. We're seeing, you know, 
you know, the, the Transportation Safety Administration spent almost, I think it was almost $2 billion on a system that they thought could possibly automatically spot people. It was called the spot system that would spot, you know, suspicious people in line at the airport. They wanted it to work. They sank oh, so much money into it. And in the end, when they investigated, they figured out it was a total wash. It didn't do, it didn't work at all. But man, do we want that, you know, we're built for that. And so from the attention economy to major pieces of government infrastructure, I think we're going to be tempted to rely on the shiny automated system over and over again when we don't want to make a decision for ourselves. Yeah. And all of the examples that you explored in the book and through the TV show and just through your own explorations, have you seen any cases where they saw this bias arise in, in the first version and then use that to adjust like is there is there possibilities that we can take this information and rather than just running with it and assuming that it's right and ignoring the bias we can then say okay we know loans are disenfranchising people of color let's you know let's make the next data set that we train our ai ai on uh get rid of that or is that something that you mentioned that they don't want to put their thumb on the scale but yeah is there any cases where you've seen that maybe be used in a positive way to, to make some well, progress against the bias? Yes. I think there is where there are ways to do it. I mean, one of the great horrors for me of the last year or so uh, in when this book came out um, is just as I was finishing it, or in fact, I had just finished it. Or I was just, just putting it away. Um, Daniel Kahneman came out with a book in which he basically argues the opposite of what I'm arguing. He argues that AI could be used to compensate for our flaws, the flaws that he spent a career identifying. And, and he's, he makes a very, you know, rational argument that that you could use AI, this neutral system to compensate for our tendencies to uh, be racist and sexist and the rest of it, or, you know, compensate for our bad choices with money, right, you could program a thing to compensate for that. And I think he's right. In theory, the thing that he does not seem to work into his argument, and this is the part that makes me so crazy, especially because he's an economist, is, oh, sorry, he, he won the Nobel Prize for economics. He's a psychologist by training, but he's, you know, moved in this, in the realms of eco economics for so long. He just doesn't think about the profit motive. And my argument is nobody's making money, making us smarter about our decisions, right? People, people empowering us to make better choices uh, very often causes us to spend less money. And so you just don't see a lot of people making money doing that, you know, and, and to me, the profit motive is the thing that we really have to keep our eye on. I think that there are extraordinary opportunities in the public sector, in uh, nonprofit work, in the art world, in uh, all sorts of amazing places where you can, you could really use AI to do extraordinary things. There was just a gathering recently of uh, antiquities experts who are really, really hopeful about using AI to fill in the gaps in the archaeological record of certain things. Because it turns out that if you, if you show AI the history of, let's say, Etruscan art, and, then, and, and you show it all the pottery that you've ever found in the world... And but you know you've got these big gaps in the record because our pottery is so fragile it doesn't last long enough you know it's it's really hard to find unbroken pieces of pottery. Um, it turns out the AI can say, oh yeah, this is probably what came in between, right? Like you can use it to do all sorts of amazing things. But again, nobody's making money off missing pottery programs. You know, um, they're making money off getting us to gamble on imaginary stuff, and and so so that's one problem. I, but but yes. But to your point of, of, you know, can we compensate for those biases? So some very smart people, um, uh, you know, have gotten into a lot of trouble arguing uh, this very thing. You know, um, uh, Temnit Jebru is this researcher at Google who was fired uh, very famously uh, after making a whole argument about how the sort of the way that, that language was being parsed by AI was picking up all kinds of uh, uh, you know, bad and potentially racist patterns. Um, and other members of her team wound up being fired as well. Um, you know, you've got people basically saying that, yes, we can work on this. We can compensate for it in some way. The problem is 
um, it's it's much harder to do that. And as you mentioned, I think you know classically trained data scientists do not like to think that they should, you know do not like to be asked to put their finger on the scale. I talked to one one guy who who you know I had heard was uh, had had experimented with it, and I asked him about that, and he worked at a big loan making company, and he told me, no, you know what. Uh, we played around with that for a moment, but but it would not be ethical for me to get involved like that. I have to, and he was talking in this case about correcting uh, racist patterns in in loan making. And he basically said, well, I, I, you know, he essentially said, I, I got to go where the data tell it leads me. And to to my mind, you know, that is an abdication of responsibility in the guise of being neutral that is going to sort of perpetuate this stuff. But I think the the final thing that I'll, I'll just say on this particular topic is that the place I am encouraged is in uh, law. And I know that liability law gets bad rap and people always like to talk about spurious lawsuits and so forth, but I consider uh, legal shenanigans to be one of the great backstops of American society because it, it really does, is the, it's the correction engine for things like a national addiction to cancer causing cigarettes. You know, it is only when the only reason you and I are not sitting here smoking right now is because of lawsuits. And I think that lawsuits are going to start piling up and legal liability is going to emerge when it comes out that people have been making loans in a racist way using AI. Suddenly the, that company is going to be culpable for that. And I think that that's going to sort of push people to, to sharpen up their yeah. skill set around this stuff and compensate for this stuff. Do, do you think it's going to be a case where those lawsuits basically come to the conclusion that you just need to throw it out? Because when does putting the thumb on the scale just become a second form of bias? You know, do, do you right. think we're just going to say, hey, we're simply just not uh, emotionally mature enough or intelligent enough uh, humans yet to do any of this automation and we should just do away with it? Or are they going to say, eh, you know what, we could probably come up with something and they'll just uh, push forward, assuming that they don't have any biases that they're baking into the new design. Right, right. I, I think it's going to slow things down. And I know that in tech circles, that's the worst thing you could possibly say, right? But I think that that is kind of what we need to do is pair back the the use cases a little bit, right? Right now, people are just so excited about AI. You know, I can't tell you how many presentations I've been to where somebody says, you know, it's, it's based on human cognition, you know, and you go, oh my God, that's, first of all, that's not good. And second of all, no, it's not. Nobody's built that yet. You know, what are you talking about? So the, the, the over promising of what this, these things can do is, is I think something that has to be corrected. And the other part of it is um, the ways in which uh, we need to, in, the, the, the manner, the, the modes we need to invent when it comes to investigating how these systems make decisions. I think anybody who listens to this podcast is probably at least, you know, somewhat familiar with how AI works. But one thing that, you know, your, your classic flavors of AI um, generally just take a data set, right, a big, big disorganized data set and draws patterns out of it and, and kicks out these answers. And it gets a little bit of guidance from, from human operators as to whether those answers are correct. And then pretty soon it's getting it right and the human operator is satisfied and it's just set loose. But at no point in the classic formulation of how this is put together, do you ever get to look inside and say, but how did you come to that conclusion? Why is this a picture of a dog and this is a picture of a cat? You know, And it turns out that if you build the most efficient form of this kind of decision-making system, uh, it, it, it's, it's a black box. And at one point I was considering calling this book a black, bo you know, black box because it's the that is the that was one of the big problems you know explainability is a big problem so i think the other thing that's going to have to happen is we're going to not only have to limit the use case a little bit so not over promise of what it is but just use it to do worker scheduling let's say and not necessarily let it choose who we hire um and i think we're going to have to make it show its work and make it legally necessary you know make it a legal responsibility of of deploying this stuff at all that you have to be able to look inside the hood and say oh this is how it made this choice and oh geez no wonder these results are so racist or whatever else it ends up being yeah do you think that we're going to just ultimately accept 
these decisions though as they come come down the line because when i look at some of the research on like ultimatum games where people are playing a game against a machine or um where they lose against a machine or even therapy sessions where they know they're talking to an ai rather than an individual there's some studies as far as i know where people aren't as upset if they lose money to a machine they aren't uh they're more open with the ai therapist than they would be with the human therapist there seems to be some kind of odd uh tendency towards trusting machines and just kind of enjoying maybe their impartial decision making as opposed yeah. to the humans like have is, have you had any thoughts on that yeah so the the you know we were talking earlier about this idea of you know the human brain being geared to hand off decisions to automated systems well not only do we have that we also have this tendency to ascribe sophistication to systems we don't understand uh, to an extent that I think is going to be especially dangerous in the realm of AI. So um, there's the famous uh, story of um, uh, Weizenbaum, the, the German-born uh, practitioner. He was, a, he was an early uh, computer scientist, basically. And in the 1960s, um, working in the United States, he came up with this system that could spit back uh, these sort of scripted sentences. It would absorb a little bit of information from you and basically more or less repeat back what you had said, but kind of keep the conversation moving forward. And he was trying to figure out a, a way to make it, you know, uh, uh, useful. He was trying to figure out what am I, gonna, how am I going to dress this thing up as something that people will actually play with? And he dressed it up as a Rogerian therapist, a psychotherapist that would repeat your stuff back at you in the, in the, style of the day and so back then when you sat down with a therapist and he's sitting there with his pipe you'd say i'm feeling very sad today and he'd say why do you think you're feeling sad and then you'd say i think it may be something to do with my mother tell me about your mother you know he would just it's that and that kind of thing turned out to be perfect for what wasenbaum had built the system that he called eliza and he deployed it first on his secretary just as an experiment and his secretary famously turned around uh within the first five minutes and said i need you to leave the room to Weizenbaum because she was so was taken with this thing and was about to reveal so much of herself to him, to him. Within a couple of years, the American Psychological Association was predicting the end of human therapy. The point of the story is that Weizenbaum quit the field. He was so appalled by what had happened that he quit and he walked off, you know, because he just said human beings are not prepared to play, you know, we're playing with fire while we play with this. This is too dangerous a thing. And, you know, for me, I think that the you know this very well established tendency of human beings to to believe in the decisions of things they don't understand you know it's why we think that that putting on a jersey and showing up at your sports team's game is going to somehow cause them to win right or that you know or you know i've fallen prey to the fallacy that <laughs> that somehow my watching a game on tv is going to affect the outcome right it's the basis of superstition it's why people throw salt over their shoulders right we don't know why that works it just seems to work so i'm just going to keep doing it and i think that that tendency is a huge one here and so you know there was a there was a case a few years ago where um the first piece of generative art came out where people used as uh, somebody used ai to basically generate a painting this kind of ever shifting set of paintings we interviewed one of these artists I, I spent time with one of these artists really fascinating beautiful work but basically he gave it like he gave this piece of ai like a thousand or so examples of his favorite 14th century oil paintings from the louvre and then he had to just kick out his favorites essentially he trained it on what his favorites would be and so it began to kick out you know the greatest hits of 14th century oil portraiture and this uh philosophy uh professor at i think it was at mit wrote in tech review this very uh angry piece about how it's not really art when a computer does that it's not really art <clears throat> and in my case you know i looked i remember reading that and thinking okay i get that in an academic sense but from a human sense and a sort of societal sense, who cares whether you think it's art or not? This dude that I interviewed sold that generative 
portrait thing for fifty thousand dollars at Sotheby's, you know, uh, and and right now, like generative AI, generative art is sweeping the art world. You know, like blockchain based art transactions, you know, uh, are are all about generative art. And now you're looking at these new systems, Doll E and um, what's the new one, Mind Journey or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, Mid Journey. Right. I think. Yeah, the Mid Journey. Thank you. Um, you know, I've got an architect friend who's kicking out these incredible renderings from from Mid Journey, and this is a guy who spent his you know spent you know decades refining his craft, and now all he has to do is say you know bubble greenhouse. Uh, you know, and out comes these things he could never have, have thought of. And so it doesn't matter whether we think that's real architecture or real art. It's acceptable to the human brain in the same way that therapy was acceptable to Weizenbaum's secretary. Um, and and so I, I think that that's the, that's the difficulty we're facing. It's like, we're not going to know the difference before long, especially when a full generation goes by, you know, I don't want to go too off topic here, but I, I, I was just watching this incredible uh, um, interview with Keanu Reeves, who was describing how he was telling his, I think his niece about the matrix who had never heard of it, never, never watched it. And he's describing, and he says, you know, this guy and he discovers he's living in a computer simulation and he can either take the red pill and be freed from the illusion of it or the blue pill and remain inside the matrix. And the niece is shocked and says, why would you take the red pill? Why wouldn't you just take the blue pill? What were you thinking? You know, and, and I've, in fact, I had conversations with several teenagers recently about this when it comes to Instagram and the rest of it. They just say, I don't care if it's addictive. I don't care if it's made by a for-profit company. I just like it. Leave me alone. You know, and I think that that's a tendency we're moving toward of, of it works on my brain. It feels good yeah. in my brain. That's good enough. You know? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that scares me about a lot of this because I've done quite a lot of behavioral research myself. And one of the things that you see is like the the tendency to, to go towards the fast thinking brain is drastically increased when you're in heightened levels of stress or fear or anxiety. And as we've been talking about, there's there's a massive profit motive that takes place in society. And if you have a lot of people who feel disenfranchised, like they don't have jobs they enjoy if they're not financially stable, which, you know, what is it like 70% of Americans don't have $500 in savings. Um, it's like, you're going to be, you're going to grasp and, and, and hold on as much as you can to these things that make you feel good. And that whole time they're just kind of taking you down that vicious spiral to the point where you, you cling to these, these decisions made for you by the AI. Yeah, that's, I think that's right. I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think that I worry that, that, you know, society is not built right now to reward good long-term thinking, right? We, and it's true and you're seeing it reflected in, you know, savings rates and you're seeing it. I mean, the pandemic forced a bunch of people to save, but that was just kind of accidental, you know, the tendency is not to do that. And those savings have gone away for the, for most of those families. Uh, you know, in climate policy, right? It's the classic version of this. We're just terrible at thinking ahead and making the hard choices now to make life easier down the road, right? The, I mean, it's the marshmallow test, right? It's the it's the inability to sit in front of one marshmallow long enough to earn a second marshmallow, right? And and I think that that I think you're absolutely right. And that is where I think a system like AI could, in theory do good work in the same way that government regulation, I think, could in theory do good work. It's just not built into our systems right now. And we definitely, if we're going to build those systems on our instinctive brain, then it's really not going to get us anywhere because, and, and so the more that the attention economy and the rest of this stuff makes us think that it's okay to just like, you know, sort of sit in an automatic life, the more vulnerable we're going to be, I think, to this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I, uh, <laughs> I get, I get pessimistic sometimes. I have to yeah. Do, do you think that the best approach to address some of these concerns is to go from the top with the policies, with the lawsuits, or do you think that there's something to be said for 
limiting the data collection. Like we haven't talked much about data privacy and data issues here, but these AIs don't really do anything if there's no data for them to train on. Like, do you do you think maybe data attacking the collection of data is a better approach or valuable? I I certainly think it's worth playing around with. I mean, right now, right, there's no data privacy at all, essentially, in the United States. I mean, there's a, you know, there's some, there's some interesting legislation moving forward, but there's almost nothing. And, you know, and in terms of, you know, any kind of like standards as a society around what is or is not acceptable when it comes to this stuff, it's moving so fast. You know, you've got people voluntarily buying surveillance devices and putting them into their homes, right? It's, you know, audio devices and doorbells with cameras on them and, you know, all that stuff. And, and so I think that we just as a society have not like reckoned with any of this in any kind of, uh, you know, forward looking way. It's just being defined by whatever is newest and being developed fastest. So that's one thing. I think you're right. Yeah, like some data privacy would be great, or at least making it expensive for companies to use your data, or at least maybe making you, uh, giving you some uh, shares in, um, uh, you know, the the benefits that those companies accrue from your data, right? Maybe if you can profit from it, you'd get some sense of just how valuable it is in totality. To these companies maybe you know i don't know yeah i think that i think that reframing the data economy and data privacy would be a really good move but i also think that as a society we gotta like take a really hard look at what we want our world to look like and what we want things to be like and there are a couple instances i cite in the book about in which we've sort of come to a collective understanding or at least sort of you know, a, a bipartisan understanding of what we think is right and wrong. One of them is backup cameras. So backup cameras were uh, a solution to a very small problem, which was uh, about 60 Americans a year were dying every uh, yeah, annually uh, when they were being backed over by a car. But the horror of it was that most of those cases were kids and most of the people doing the backing up were parents. And so it's the most horrible thing anyone can imagine. And anyone from any political background, I think, can get together on that one and say, well, that's totally unacceptable. We cannot have that in this society. And as a result, a bipartisan effort came together. And it's now mandatory that if you buy a, a car in the United States, it has to come with a, you know, a new car. It has to come with a backup camera. And that adds price to the car. It adds price to you know to it adds money that you have to pay. It creates all this stuff, you know. But from a, from the top down, as a society, we said we need this to be the case because we that is that is a evil thing happening, and we need it to stop. Um, you know, and I also think about you know uh, vaccines. There's a whole separate legal system in effect for handling the rare instances in which a kid has an alert, typically a kid has an allergic reaction to a routine vaccine. This is long before COVID or any of this other stuff. And it's, it's not, you know, this is not vaccine craziness. This is just the fact that when you deploy a medication, you know, a chemical across as many people as, as we do with vaccines every year, there are these very small number of cases in which it, people have an allergic reaction. They t- typically have a Guillain-Barre syndrome response. And that handful of cases every year, though, we needed a way to deal with that. And so there's a thing, it's in sight of the, of the, of the White House, there's the vaccine court in Washington, D.C., where you can go and you get paid out millions of dollars for the suffering of your child, possibly the death of your child. It happens almost instantaneously. It's, it's a, like a weeks long process. It doesn't take very long. There's a special master who does the, you know, is an appointed judge that makes the decisions. And it basically happens outside the the normal bounds of liability law in the united states those vaccine companies the manufacturers pay into or they charge you and you pay into um, a fund that creates the fund for all of those cases it's like a hundred cases a year i think something like that um 
And those vaccine makers, as a, in exchange, do not have to take, there's no fault, it's a no fault system, they don't have any legal liability, they just have to pay into the system to keep the system going, because as a society, we've decided we need vaccines, they're one of the greatest life saving inventions in the history of humankind. And so we keep those going. So to my mind, like backup cameras, vaccine courts, like we know how to create special rules that govern special circumstances when society recognizes that something needs to be corrected. I think we can all sense that something weird's happening right now and needs to be corrected. It's just moving so fast and in so many different pieces, and there's so much money to be made off of it. It's making it difficult for us to get our arms around it in advance, I think. Well, with those beacons of hope that you just kind of exhibited there, you know, as we, we kind of get close to the end here, are you optimistic do you feel that this is is a moment of of growing pains and that we're just going to mature out of it are you kind of thinking actually this this might be kind of a special circumstance where it might be a a, a feedback loop that goes in a negative direction like after after exploring this what's your felt sense of of the future well, I, I am pessimistic in the short term because I do think that it's going to be very difficult to shake anyone free, you know, at a time when we've all just had these incredible economic jitters from a global pandemic that shut down society. You know, I think people are going to be very motivated to try to, you know, I'm speaking to you today uh, uh, on a day when new jobs numbers have come out and everyone's super excited that they are more than, than everybody had originally forecast, you know, I think economic indicators are really catching a lot of attention these days because we're worried about the ability of the United States to continue to, to grow and be a, a hugely, you know, productive and resource filled society, right? And so I, I worry that in the short term, we're going to prioritize that over having to make some tough, and in some cases, money limiting decisions around stuff like technology. But I am encouraged in the long term by humankind's history of being able to correct for bad stuff. And I think that we have, whether it's in just like raw innovation, you know, medicine and uh, seat belts and, you know, the ways in which we have invented ways to, to protect ourselves from danger, um, or whether it's regulatory, you know, whether in the form of lawsuits or um, you know, people coming together across the political divide and, and making a, a choice. I do think we've been pretty good at that stuff in the past. I hope that in a generation, I'm sitting with a grandchild. My kids are eight and 10 right now, eight and 11 right now. And so I, I, I there's a ways off, but I'm thinking, you know, if my grandkid, I hope that my grandkid is sitting with me someday at the end of my life, you know, when we're having lunch and she'll ask me, why did you guys think it was okay to give phones to kids back then? <laughs> you know, yeah. like in the same way that I asked my grandfather, why did you smoke? You know, and I, I smoke cigarettes too, but, but still, you know, like, why did everyone think that was okay? You no, know? like, I think there's going to be this reckoning with this stuff where we're recognized that we were, that there was quick money to be made often off of, uh, you know, a, a, technology that we knew in some form was dangerous, but weren't quite sure how, you know, I think we're going to get to that place where we're going to figure it out, figure out the real costs and, and slap a, a sticker price on it such that we can really make some hard decisions in society about it. So I'm, I'm confident about it in the next couple of generations, but in this generation, I think it may be too much for me to hope that it's going to turn itself around. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it's still a, an optimistic note in my book, so I'll take it. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, as we come to the end here, man, um, I want to just give you a chance to, you know, if there's anything you want to talk about and if you have any new things coming up that you want to share. Yeah, thank you. God knows when I'll write another book. I, I, I do, I have this dream of writing one for kids, a version of this for kids. It's like a crash course in behavioral science and technology for kids, because I think that that is a really missing element in society right now. So if anybody out there is interested in teaming up on that, I'd be very interested to speak with you. Um, I work for NBC News, and so I, I urge you to, to um, tune into us. I, I work as one member of a really big team of really great journalists who cover all kinds of amazing stuff around misinformation of the gig economy and all sorts of things around technology and its ills. So um, NBC News, uh, I really have deep respect for what it does. Um, but yeah, I just really hope that, that we can all continue to look sort of 
you know, at this as a, you know, not just a technological issue, but as a social and ethical issue, because I think that's really what's coming up. And, uh, you know, I really hope mine is, I know it won't be, but I really hope mine's not the last book written on a subject like this and that people get even smarter about stuff that I've only just begun to think about. Yeah. Well, thanks for driving the conversation forward, man. And thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Stephen. Take care.